I was Matthew chapter 12. Amen. Well, it seems like a while since the last time we were talking about, again, the life of Christ, which is usually our midweek study. We're going to take off, take up, rather, where we left off before in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. This was the afternoon of the same day, amen, when the Lord, probably one of this, in the scriptures speaks about one of, his seemingly longest days of ministry that he had. Verse 38, Then certain of the scribes of the Pharisees saying, answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seek it after a sign. Now see, Jesus wouldn't be liked in most churches. Amen. He just told it like it was. Hallelujah. He went right to the he went right to the point. And if you really analyze his messages, he didn't preach to pacify. Amen. But he told him, There shall no sign be given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And even when he talked and praised God, most of them didn't understand what he was saying. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, they understood what, that about Jonah, but they lost him when he talked about himself. <laughs> he lost them. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Hallelujah. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Of course, it was three or so years later that Nineveh was finally destroyed. But at least everybody, the king made everybody go on the fast, including the animals. Amen. It denoted what? With fear they believed what the prophet said. So Jesus is making reference to this. And shall condemn you, for, for she came unto the uttermost parts of, for, for she came of, um, from the uttermost, verse 42, parts of the earth, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, I skipped the, the first part of that verse. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, where well, he gave him two witnesses, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Talking about himself. But they never recognized it. When, now he, now, now he's giving a spiritual principle. Now you can understand from this spiritual principle that he gives, when you go into a city, when you go into a nation, even when you minister to someone, whether they have been saved or not, or whether they've heard the word before or not, Jesus has said, Jesus said, this is what happens when you hear truth. And don't respond to it. So he cite this spiritual principle to them. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he said, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he come out, he found it empty, swept, and garnished. Now he just didn't throw this in there out of the blue. Amen. He's telling them What's going to happen to them when he walk away from them and they don't hear his truth? Amen. That's what he's telling them. That's why he could make the statement, what? That Nineveh, all of those, will condemn you in that day. And remember, he went on several times and, and told, told those, and we looked at that last time, he told those in Tyre and Sidon the exact same thing. So you can see, brother, sister, when you are dealing with people who don't walk in truth, not just those who backslide, but those who hear and don't walk in it, you're dealing with people with strong demonic strongholds around their hearing. Amen. They hear you with this ear, their outer ear, but not their inner ear. The fear 
of the gospel, amen, is no longer there. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you, I mean, you, 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 where you, where you sit and, and your level of comprehension now and where you are, you would say to yourself, how, how can one, how can one run from truth? Why aren't people afraid to not obey the Lord? Why are they not? Why, why, why are they afraid not to, dis, uh, to disobey? Let's put it that way. But you've got to understand what has happened. Several layers of darkness has encased them. Amen. Now listen. Unless someone get a hold of the horns of the altar for them. Amen. There will be no breakthrough. Unless someone, unless God, as Timothy says, give them space to repent, there will be no breakthrough. Amen. Because judgment cries out to them to be judged. They trample underfoot the blood of Christ. Judge them. So what do they need at this point? They need someone on the earth who has favor with God. Amen. So that means you who are walking in truth, you have to have a level of love for the king in your life where the Lord is jealous over you. Better yet, better yet, you have a greater chance of getting the master's ear on behalf of those who have trampled underfoot the blood of Christ if you are his friend. Huh? His friend. We see that, amen, the first place this plays out in Scripture between Abraham and the Lord. The Lord was willing to keep alive a whole corrupt cities just because Abraham asked him to. I want to really hit this home. I want to really hit this home. Especially now. To pull those out of the fire... In these days, you must present a life to the Lord that is pleasing to him. Now, what is at work here? You must die so others can live. That's what it comes down to. Amen. Religion is not going to bring those out of bondage who hear truth and don't do it. Amen. Religion is not going to bring them out. Praise God. If you, amen, being evil, as, as Jesus said, can have mercy on somebody, someone asks you for something and they don't deserve it, and because you have mercy, because you like them, Okay, I'm going to do it. If you being evil, what about the Lord? You say, well, why would the Lord do this? Because this is the lesson he's trying to teach you. This is the lesson he's trying to teach you, to be like him. Come on. Verse 45, then God, he and take it with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be until this wicked generation. Now, what does Jesus call a wicked generation? Those who trample on the foot the blood of God. 
he called them wicked. The Bible doesn't tell us how many times they heard him preach, but many heard him preach in those three and a half years he was on this earth, many times. And they refused. Now Mark 3 and 31. Mark 3, 31. Now, before we read that, let me, let me point this out. Now, you, you to, to get <laughs> now here, here, here's a group of people that Jesus identified. What, what did what did, it was Jesus or Paul said? Paul, but Jews is require sign, <laughs> and Greeks <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> Amen. And so there were the the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and of course, since you understand who they were, and the scribes was the ones who, as wrote, took record. And so they came to Jesus seeking a sign. And so Jesus gives them another principle as well. Not just this one. But he gives them another principle. Okay? He calls them, yes, yeah, First Corinthians, Paul said to the Corinthians, First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews require a sign and, and Greeks seek after wisdom. So he calls them on a dozen generation and he refused to give them the sign. But he quoted that verse that I told him about John. I mean, about Jonah, rather. So, Jesus then would be the fulfillment of this sign. That's what, and you, of course, you know that. That's what he was saying to them. I'm the sign. So he put it where, where it, sh where it should be, because salvation only comes through who? Him. Amen. And so, so he tells them he will be three days and three days and nights. And so this is, this is confirmed by 1 Peter 3 and 19 and 20. The Bible says, Peter said, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now look at the mercy of God. The spirits in prison, which sometime was disobedient, when once the long suffering of God Waited in the days of Noah. Waited in the days of Noah. When the angels helped Noah build the ark. What? 400 and something years? While the ark was preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So, so Jesus refused to give them a sign, which wouldn't do any good, which wouldn't have done any good anyway. To desire that, so, 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 like even today, though the Lord will use you in the last days. Not necessarily to, to bring signs, but to bring deliverance to people. Many times that deliverance, the deliverance in itself will not cause a person to believe. The deliverance in itself will free a person from darkness so that they can believe. Amen. Just as a person who has walked away from truth. So the spirit that comes back and is seven times stronger is a, is a, is a spirit of divination. To do what? Blind one. 
from truth and the urgency that they should have to get right with God. Amen. I, you, you, you haven't mentioned someone in, the, in their condition. If, if they don't say it, and then I even had people say it, what they think they have all the time in the world to make a turnaround. Amen. So, so, so brother, sister, you, you, you're fighting more than just a stubborn person. See, it's more than just stubbornness. A spirit of divination done entrenched itself in a person's psyche. And it's literally a battle of darkness. And And so, and typically what happens is a person that condition, the more you try to talk to them without prayer, then the more angry you make them. Amen. See, the enemy plays games with their head. And, and immediately, the enemy always used this one. They see you, though you don't come out like that, they see you, that you think you're better than them. Amen. All you're trying to do is present truth, though. So the enemy, <coughs> so you see, it's the, the demon that plays mind games is the spirit of divination. Hallelujah. So pretty much, what are they doing? They're releasing witchcraft on themselves by their disobedience. Amen. So what I'm saying to you is it takes warfare. Warfare. And you have to get God to hear you Based upon, first, his love for you. <laughs> his love for you. Why was God always pronouncing his love for his son? How obedient he was. How faithful he was. Because his son was there to do what? what he wanted him to do, even to die for what he wanted. Amen? So to bring someone out of darkness into light, it's going to require a price of you. Something that a person may not never ever see or appreciate until they stand before the Lord in heaven and stand before you. I mean, really, really see. You understand when I say that? Really see with no darkness in the way. Actually, the price. Now, see, we heard the story of the gospel. We know what happened to Jesus. But we don't, we have yet to comprehend the death of what happened. I mean, we're we really... We know he shed his blood. But we have yet to plunge the depth of what was really at stake. Amen. Those are things that we are yet to comprehend. In the same way, in the same way, amen, those who you bring into the kingdom. Especially, especially loved ones. Because, see, our attitude many times, I mean, when we, when we look at them, amen, their stupidity, their hard headedness, their stubbornness, and many times our attitude is, you know, as they said, bump them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they deserve it. I mean, really. I mean, especially if some way you are impacted by their 
disobedience. Amen. You see how quickly the enemy wants to move you to not be tolerable. So, so, so can you see the death you must die? The price you must pay? It is the same price that Jesus paid. The exact same price. See? This is what makes you his friend. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. So, even if they had seen signs, they would not have repented. And this, and this is the point that the Lord, the Lord made. Now, of course, and this is illustrated in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. This is another spiritual principle that we told you about. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto you from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. So, so Jesus continued by saying, in reference to Jonah, that the men of Nineveh repented at his preaching, at Jonah's, and for that reason would rise up in condemnation of Jesus' generation because they did not repent from the Son of Man. God preached to them. Of course, and he mentioned the Queen of Sheba. So in verse 43 and 45, Jesus likened this generation to a man who had been cleansed of evil spirits. Again, a principle that they didn't understand. So this is where many, as I pointed out to you, one area I just already, several areas I pointed out to you, where many deliverance ministries have erred. So we have to take great care that when we when we cast out demons, let's go a little, let's go a little deep, uh, deeper in casting them out, whether they be possess a person or influence, okay? It's no different. That we have to give clear direction, hear clear directions from the Lord, from the Lord to do so. This is why the Lord went certain places and didn't deliver everybody where he went. The Lord was even in selective in doing that. Amen. He left many people in their condition. Now, there can be many reasons, but I guarantee you some of the reasons was this principle here. You do a person more harm than good. Amen. If they are not ready to hear. Hallelujah. So, Jesus said all this to say that the state of his generation, which had the opportunity of receiving him but refused it, will definitely be worse than before he came. Amen. Amen. So incidentally, the generation that rejected, that crucified the Lord, saw the, Roman, saw the Roman Empire crucified. That same generation that rejected Jesus, that denied it. They saw, because remember Jesus got up and wept and told them what would happen to their temple. They saw the Romans crucify over 4,000, 400,000 of their sons. And destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. I, I tell you, brothers and sisters, it is. I've, I've always pondered this. A heart can go to a place where not even God can convince it to turn. That's saying a lot. Because we ourselves would say, well, anybody, well, anybody, if they hear the truth, 
would want to turn, right? But that's not the case. What can, what can take a heart down a journey called life and be impacted by certain things in its life and not humble oneself. See, that is the key right there. Humility. As easy as it is, it is a very hard thing. Humility. One must see that they need something greater than what's in them. The moment they begin to humble, boom, something breaks out of them and their eyes are open. That is, that is a dangerous place to be and to go and to end up in. A heart, heart to such a degree. So, so certainly to whom much is given, and this is principles is, is, is enwrapped in this, is this teaching with Jesus. This, this, another principle, rather, is wrapped in this principle that he taught about spirits going out. What? Much is given, much is required. You are weighed on a different scale than another. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit taking in consideration how many times you sat and hear the gospel? And someone else who may have done as much as you or worse. And here's the first time and breaks and humble themselves. And they end up in heaven and you end up in hell. Because you're away with a different scale. Whom much is given, much is required. Now, Mark 3, 31. We come to this place in the next in Jesus' journey where his mother and brethren seek to bring him home. Because some of them thought he was crazy. <laughs> Amen. I mean, to put it plainly. Huh? But guess what? You got to keep going for the Lord. 331. There came then his brethren and his mother, standing without, sent unto him, calling him. Now, listen, Mary knows a whole lot more about who he is than his siblings. Now, we don't know whether it was Mary that was, but by what Jesus says later, Tells us what? That she was there being influenced by, by his siblings. By what Jesus said later. Because remember now, this is the virgin. She knows who this is. She knows who he is. She knows this is the son of God. Huh? Elizabeth prophesies it to her. But some of his siblings got a problem with it. Okay? And so Mary is under this influence by her children. So how you can say that? By what Jesus said later. Okay? And the multitude said about him, they said un and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother without seat for thee. And listen to what Jesus says by this statement. Is why I said what I said. He answered them saying, who is my mother? <laughs> or my brother? And he looked around about on them which sit about him and said, behold my mother and my brother. Now here's the clincher. Here's the revelation. Whosoever shall do the will of God the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. 
Amen. Now, this is what I'm saying. Mary's now is in this, posi- in this position. Not, I, 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 no doubt she's not totally denying because of later on in Jesus' ministry. But she's under the influence of her siblings. Huh? Can you see him? You need to go get him. You need to go get him. <laughs> Something's wrong with him. Huh? He called himself the son of God. You need to go get him. Well, Mary knows he is, but they don't. So Jesus makes, this is why Jesus makes this statement that he made. Now, Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Look what Matthew said about it. Matthew 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without. Desiring to speak with him. The Bible doesn't tell them what they want to speak to him about. <laughs> but you know what, he, what they want because of what he says about them. His response was. Right? Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? <laughs> and who is my brother? Now they probably thought at that point Jesus, Jesus was crazy. <laughs> See, this is deep mysteries that Jesus is bringing to them. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? And he stretched forth his hands toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brother. For whosoever shall do the will of the Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Now, a couple of verses in Luke. Look what Luke said. Luke 8, verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brother, and he could not and, and could not come at him for the press. They, that's why they stopped. That's why they didn't come up to him. Now, Luke reveals this. They didn't stop because they were kind of standoffish, didn't want to break what he was saying. They couldn't get to him because of all the people that were around him. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brother stand without, desiring to see thee. And he says, answered and said to them, My mother and my brother are these which hear the word of God and do it. See? So we know different ones and his siblings had trouble hearing and doing what he was saying. Amen? All right. So, so one of the most common and, to a certain degree, justifiable complaints heard in our generation is that one comes from a dysfunctional home. <laughs> of course, you know what this means. This refers to an abnormal home in which either the father or mother is not there or was abusive. Or there are divisions amongst the children. Now, certainly, this was the case, which I think I've proven, with, with, with our Lord. Not abuse, but the Bible doesn't tell us when Joseph passed. Amen. But it was definitely before all his kids got grown. Amen. Because Jesus was the oldest, and he had at least, what, four brothers and at least, least two sisters, because the Bible said his sisters. So most likely had more than two. So Mary most likely had, what, between six, seven, or maybe eight children. So Jesus being the oldest, and it was 30-something when he died, and so... Um, what happened to Mary? She went in to live with John. Right? Jesus didn't even leave him with, with, with his own siblings. She went in with John. 
Now we know at least two of his brothers, amen, got it together, James and Jude. <laughs> right? And they, some of the epistles he made it into the scriptures. But there was definitely some dysfunctionality going on in his ministry early on. That's the point I wanted to make. All right? So, they didn't understand. Again, now Mary did. They did not understand who Jesus was. And were now seeking to bring him home. So, his brothers at this time did not believe in his ministry. And certainly, certainly, <laughs> they didn't believe in his deity. Now, I know. See, they had a choice to believe this. You know their mother told them, he's not Joseph's son. You know she told them. But they still had to choose to believe that. They wasn't there. Just like you wasn't there when Jesus was born. So therefore the Lord, as the Apostle Paul says, as Paul says, was tempted in all points as we are, but without sin. See, the Lord had to deal with the same thing too amongst his family. Amen. <laughs> Will it be your children? Huh? Some of mine believe that I'm not I'm doing what I'm not supposed to be doing. They were persuaded by somebody else. But you got to obey God. So we can take courage that because of his fellowship in trial, the Lord Jesus can secure or keep us in times of need when our family don't understand us. Amen. Amen. And a lot of time they're berating of you and putting down is that spirit in them that hates you obey. That's what's happening. You, you, you still have to see them through eyes of mercy. Hmm? I mean, I'm passing, I'm passing young ladies, amen, who, who husbands will not save. They hate, now, now listen to this. This is how messed up, you know, the spirit, again, of, of witchcraft can get um, messed up with a person's eyes. I'm up preaching the gospel. But they saw me as an enemy <coughs> because they, their spouses was obeying the word. They weren't obeying me, they was obeying the word. <laughs> but they hated me and they looked at me having more power over their spouses than them because they obeyed the word. And I'm not nowhere in the picture. I'm just a delivery boy. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. So a lot of this is going on. It's a, it's a, it's a control issue. <laughs> But you heard the story of Smith Wigglesworth. Um, he attributed him coming into the kingdom because of his wife. So everything is, Smith did in his ministry, his wife got a reward. He tell her, you ain't going to church. You ain't going down to that church. She said, Smith, listen, I'm your wife. I supply your need, but you ain't my Lord. He had her shoes. She put on Kroger sacks or bags and walked to church with no shoes on. And then he'd lock her out the house. He was a devil. See, that's what the devil does. Trying to get you to crack. Lock her out the house. She'd get up close to where the heat come out the door and <laughs> fall asleep. And this is what made the devil even better. He'd open the door, she'd stumble in. Hey, Smith, how you doing? What you want for breakfast? <laughs> huh? She didn't come in cash, cash, cursing, throwing pots and pans at her, you know, like these so-called shade women <laughs> do. Smith said, that's what got him. 
That's what got him. After he got through dealing with his own pride and everything, she wouldn't fight with that devil <laughs> that was in him. <laughs> Praise God. Huh? Amen. See, so a lot of lots going on there. And what are you doing? You're dying. You're dying to self. Because your love for the Lord. Amen. That's what makes you his friend. And he'll reach down and say that old scoundrel, just because of you. <laughs> huh? Hallelujah. So, after Jesus' ascension, his brothers understood, like I said, at least we got record, at least two we know. Could be more, but at least we got record, at least two of them. Like I said, James and Jude. So we can be encouraged and believe that God will in time cause our families to serve him. Amen? Amen? But it will cost you. The price you must pray can be different than the price I had to pray. But it's one of death nonetheless. Amen? Crucifying the flesh, what I'm saying. So, praise God. So, so to the declaration that his mother and brothers were outside looking for him, Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Behold, my mother and my brother. So Jesus, he didn't give any special place of promise to his natural mother. Mary, in fact, we see by this, Mary had no special influence over the life of Jesus. Now, you know, you know Jesus greatly respected her, but he was going to preach truth. Amen. He was going to preach truth. And Mary, as the old saying goes, Mary had to get hers just like everybody else. Huh? Mary was in the upper room being baptized just like all the rest of them. Matter of fact, as I said before, who much is given, much is required. That was more required by Mary than others. Because of what had happened to her. Her in, in experiencing the power of God in her womb. Raising the son of God. She was judged much greater. Amen. So, they had, my point is, they had to pass their test. Just like you have to pass yours. Another point here is that the thought of spiritual relationship. Very often our closest relationship are not with our own family members. Okay. Now before I move to Alaska, my closest spiritual relationship was one of my oldest sisters. She was my one and but I guess because both of us in the world together. We both parted together. <laughs> and then, then she got saved before I did. <laughs> Amen. So that way, that was always, she was like always my favorite, you know. And I missed her greatly when she, when she passed. But other than that, because of my, my, the distance of my siblings, I wasn't, I guess the only other one that, that, that I'm that close to now is my baby sister. You know, far as thing. But, but typically, typically as a whole, we're usually closer, you know, to non-family members than we are to our, to our family members. That's typically the way, spiritually speaking, I'm talking about. <clears throat> And so that spiritual relationship establishes that close connection. Okay? That's what I'm saying. So, so the Lord Jesus Christ, who is who are our brother, 
those who do the will of the Father. That, that it, it, it brings that connection. In other words, it was more than just a cliche when Jesus said that. It was more than that. Amen. There was a spiritual connection, a bond, that is closer than blood if they're not saved. Okay? They're not saved. So, and then, and then, then, too, there is some people, you, you know, that you just, you know, prefer to be around more than, than others. Now, a lot of times, we don't think about this, but a lot of times, it has to do with our connection before we came from heaven. Amen. Some are called to work together. Amen. Some are called to work together for a season. Some are called to work together the entire time they're on the earth. Amen. So that's a heavenly thing. And so when, when we as people, humans, let that play out and don't let that get in the way, then we'll see that bonding. And I'm going to tell you this. That is the relationship that the devil will try to destroy. I've seen him do it between people. And they don't even recognize the importance of it. That impacts your future in some way. Because you just can't rewrite your destiny. You can't do it. But, you know, we humans are always trying to. <laughs> so, fellowship then. Fellowship is based upon what? Walking in the light. So our sweetest fellowship and close relationship will be with those who have the same spirit and vision as we have. Amen. And those who are walking in the light, of course. Now, real quickly. Um, can we look at some parables? The parable. Let's look at some parables. Look at Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four. I don't know if I even should start this. How much time I got more? Oh shoot, good time. Mark four. Look at chapter chapter four, verse one. And he began again to teach by the sea, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into his ship and sat at the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said, un and said unto them, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sword to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And some fell on stony ground, and when it had not much earth, immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no roots, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. And he said unto them, He that heareth, he that had ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about, about him with the twelve asked him, the, ask him of, asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But unto them that are without, all those things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be given, should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? Now I know some people read that and say, Well, you mean Jesus purposely didn't want some to hear and, and did want some to hear? No, that's not what he's saying. The key was previously, he that adhered to hear, let him hear. So what is he saying? Something within the heart, if it was right, and they're humbling, and, and how they hear, then they would see. They would hear what he was saying. See? 
It wasn't a selective thing from heaven. It was something that they chose themselves on the earth. Amen. It's no different today. That principle is the same today. Amen. It's the same today. The Bible tells you how to hear. But it only, not only tells you what you should hear, but it tells you how. See? The what was what he was preaching. The how is what determined if they would hear. How they heard. See? So this is what Jesus was continuing with. So he wasn't willfully playing games with mind games with them. <laughs> okay? So... Verse 13, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? So he said unto them, If you don't understand this parable, you will not understand any other parable that I say to you. None other. The source of the word. Now he's explaining to them. The source of the word. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they heard when they heard, Satan come in the immediate and take the word that was sown in their heart. And these, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard, the word immediately received it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time. Afterwards, when affliction or persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the, and the cares of this world, and the deceiving of the riches, and the lust of other things, entering and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, bring it forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. And he said unto them, then he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not be sat on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was, neither was anything kept secret that should not come abroad. See, this is something about truth. There's something about truth. When truth is preached to the saved or the unsaved, something is manifested inside of you. Something is manifested. And at that moment, at that moment, you must humble yourself to be free. Amen. At that moment. So see, it's always a character issue. Always. Save or unsave. Even a saved person can make it for themselves just as hard as an unsaved person who is hearing for the first time. Can make it just as hard for them. Because when truth comes and shows you yourself, and you're not what you think you are, or you have highly exalted yourself above, the, above that you ought to think, and now you got to humble yourself at that truth in order to be delivered and walk free. You are in danger. If you do not do that, you will become offended. And you will never be free. That foundation will not be laid in your life. You will step back from that. You might go on walking with the Lord, but you will, you will, you veered off at that moment. And everything that you would hear from then on, amen, will be a half-truth or a lie. Or you make it, it make it easier for the enemy to deceive you from that point on. Amen. So what do you have to do? You have to go back now right where you veered off and got offended and establish that truth in your life for you to go on with the Lord. I'm talking about spiritually go on. You can go on religiously, which many are doing in the church. They're going on religiously, but not spiritually. Do you hear me? <coughs> very, important, very important principle. 
Um, anybody know why I stopped reading? Okay. <clears throat> For nothing here which shall not be manifest, and neither shall anything be kept secret, shall not come around. If any man has ears to hear, he says again, let him hear. Let him hear. And he says unto them, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be made unto you. To the degree you hear. That doesn't mean I'm clean my ear out and I'm straining to try to hear what you say. No, that's not what he's saying. To the degree that you deal with yourself and can hear what truth is saying. To that degree, to that degree, the effort you make, let's say it this way, in hearing and dealing with yourself is to the degree that you would hear and be set free. That's what he's saying. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. See? You should not, you should take more seriously truth when you hear it. Ask yourself a question. Do you make the same effort in hearing that you do every time? Do you make the same effort, effort in dealing with your flesh and judging yourself when you hear truth? When you're meditating the word yourself, do you make the same effort each time to hear? Think about it. Because if you are not, whatever you are lacking, then the enemy can come in and hinder you. Whatever you are lacking. If I'm putting out, if I have the, let's look at it this way. If I have the capacity to put out 80%, but every time you see me, I'm putting out 50. Where's the other 30 going? Spiritually speaking, it's giving way to the enemy. Do you hear what I'm saying? Anything that is not of faith is sin. If I walk in here and I have the ability, and the Lord knows what that is, to give the Lord 80% of praise, but I give him 40, where's the other 40% going? That's 40, that's, that's 40, that's 40 degrees that the enemy is able to make an entrance in. And then now you can understand why is it if I go into the presence of the Lord, I feel like I've lost more than what I came in with. This is what he means here. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. See, watch this. I prove this by this next statement. And unto him that hear shall more be given. Right? So that means if you don't make to the same degree to hear, what happens? It will be taken. <laughs> For he that had to him will be given. And he that had not, from him shall be taken even that which he had. See, because of this principle I just told you. 
When much is given, much is required. If you're not giving your 100% all the time, then where is the rest going? It can be taken from you. I have always lived my life. I will give the Lord my everything or nothing at all. Always. Then he goes on to say, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, should sleep and rise night and day. The seed spring up and grow up and he knoweth not how. For the earth bringing forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. The principle of growing. 30, 60, 100. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately put in the sickle because the harvest is come. Now you can take that same, that same thing they're talking about measure, not giving you 100%. Now you can understand why the those who are on good ground, all those who are there, and you still have 30, 60, and 100. No hindrances. No stony ground. No none by the wayside. This is all good ground. Thirty, sixty, hundred. You cannot become a son of God with thirty or sixty fold. You cannot dwell in the secret place of the Most High with thirty or sixty fold. You cannot become like Him with thirty or sixty fold. You cannot. Only a hundred percent. Right? You agree? So, during the same day, the Lord gives the parable of the kingdom. He sees the great multitude. He goes into a, he goes and pulls up a, uh, asks one of the fishermen another uh, uh, place. He asks them to borrow their boat. He sits in the boat. He pushes out from the shore, and then he starts preaching. Like I said, this is one of the best and the most notable parables that Jesus gave. He acknowledged that himself. It, this particular one enables us to understand the different spiritual categories of mankind and ground. Category and ground. So the different degrees and variations and conditions of the heart. Not only can your heart, whole heart, be conducive with one type of ground, you can have all different types of ground within your heart. So you have to be dealing with different aspects of your heart in retrospect to sowing. In other words, you cannot take the same attitude in receiving the word in one area and do it in the same area. You cannot. This is why we lose. Because there's some parts of your heart that what? Don't want to do it. Deep down inside. There's some parts of your heart you will struggle more in doing. So that's why you can't take the same stance. You cannot take the same position. You can't take, you can, you can take the same attitude, laziness, lackadaisiness. You understand what I'm saying? You must make an, a decision to go 100% in every area. Because some parts of you will fight you more than other parts. This is why. Some only 30. 
some on it 60, some on 100. Do, do you all understand what I'm saying to you? You might hear truth in God's word and love that truth and desire, but you, can hear, you can't expect or think you will have the same attitude, perception, understanding, disposition when you hear something else. You must bring that same attitude over to something that you don't want to hear. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. That's three parts of you. You know outwardly you have to love all of God's word, but inwardly you struggle. We all do. In hearing certain truth. Come on. You, uh, for example, you might find it easy to forgive that person over here, but you struggle with that person over there. <laughs> That's what I mean. So, the wayside, the wayside. The sore first souls see by the wayside. That speaks of the type of heart that is not prepared to receive God's word, right? Because of lack of understanding, the devil is able to snatch away that seed that was sown, and it does not bear fruit, okay? Now, you can say, you, you, the person who's not prepared to receive revelation, for different reasons. Whatever reason. As I said earlier, not saved, rebellion, don't have the right foundation to understand what you are presently hearing, fighting against truth, real truth, whatever the case may be. Then you have the stony places. Stony place speaks of a hardened heart. One who is offended unforgiveness, mad at God, okay? These type of people receive, they receive the word with joy, but do not allow God to work within them that root and that mess that's deep down inside of them. <laughs> See, when God requires more, they become offended. As a result, when trials and suffering come their way, they fall back again, become more offended, and they don't produce any fruit. Then you have the thorns. The thorny ground represents Christians who are filled with the cares, the riches. You know, they're having fun, trying to enjoy life by working themselves to death, making everything about themselves. The cares and riches and pleasures of life. And they choke the word of God that's sown in their heart. And they do not bring any fruit to perfection or maturity. As I said before, you, can't be some, you, can't be, you cannot become a son of God or a bride of Christ without perfection or growing up spiritually. Then you have good ground. The fourth type of ground in heart, and we end with this one. The fourth type of ground in heart is good ground. Now remember that you can have all these grounds inside of you. Your objective is to fill your heart, all of it, with good ground. That's the overcoming life. That's what you're worrying about. Okay? And even then, as I said earlier, with good ground, you still got to be diligent. You cannot slack up. You cannot. So this represents those who receive the word of God. Receive it. But even there is a division. They see it with joy. They're doing it. They're doing it. But even there is a division. Some of them bring forth 30, as I said, of the 60, of the 100 fold. Why? The number one, if I could say it up in two words, why? Lack of discipline and obedience. Lack of discipline and obedience. 
Maybe those who have a clean heart and a diligent spirit that bring forth a hundredfold fruit for the Lord. Because of this, there is not a high percentage of people who respond to the Lord. Because this is what this is about, responding. What you hear and how you hear. Remember, there's different types of ground in you. Some parts is easy. But other areas, you got to make sure you're hearing it right. There's no attitude. There's no ism about you. There's no schism about you. So even if it's all good and it falls in, this particular prayer, now, here's the numbers. And this is the reason why God gave us statistics. Only one out of four, one out of four bore fruit. When you look at the entire parable, four types of ground, right? One out of four bore fruit. Out of the four, only a third bore a hundredfold. Now, if you don't hear, remember anything else I say, <coughs> you need to hear this. This is why everyone is not invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. One out of four brought forth fruit. And only a third of them brought forth a hundredfold. Only a third. That should frighten you. It certainly does me. Why do all that you're doing just to become a citizen of heaven? Yeah, he's going to hell. But why go through this hell on earth? Why go through all this test and get to heaven and prove to all in heaven all on judgment day that you did not love him enough? That's what it comes down to. You loved your own life more. Sixty percent of your life you love more. Thirty percent of your life you love more. The hundredfold is the bridal company. Amen? What am I saying to you? Brother, sister, we have to cry out to the Lord. And more than just cry out, you have to do, you have to be diligent that we will be hundredfold Christians that we may go all out for the Lord and produce much fruit. Much fruit. Now you can understand what Jesus said through the prophet Isaiah. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life. <coughs> <coughs> 
and few there be that find it. What life? You can have 30% of life, 60% of life, 100% of life. To get closer to the Lord, it's going to require more death out of you. So while understanding that, you have to make sure that you keep your character as such that you don't harden your heart. That you are a creature who's constantly humbling themselves. And not become offended to truth. Ever. Amen? See, it's one thing to know where you're going. It's another thing to know how you're going to get there. Many have veered off, have veered off, and didn't even realize they had veered off. That space right there where they stiffen their neck. And when you stiffen your neck and refuse to humble yourself, then you're blinded. At that point, you have to listen to someone else to get back on track because your own heart is deceiving you. You have to listen to someone else. That's your only way out. But at that point, you're not listening to anyone else. That's why you don't find your way back. Pride. And with pride, you believe your own lie. Come on, stand to your feet. Close your eyes for a moment. The most important parable that Jesus ever gave. It sets a precedent. Not only of how the kingdom of God operates. How your heart operates. but what you need to do to keep your heart right for the kingdom of God to grow within you. Father, we thank you tonight for the simplicity of the word. When it comes right down to it, Holy Spirit, who is the writer of the book, is the only one who can reveal our own heart to us. The moment we make excuses for our sins, our ground is not conducive. To the seed anymore. But when we acknowledge to you Lord. 
our weaknesses, our shortcomings, and allow you to take us through the valley of the shadow of death. For those things are crushed within us. And we surrender our life in full trust and assurance that you would lead us through and make us better in the end. Can we only produce a hundredfold? We know from your word it is not outwardly doing a hundredfold work for you. It is inwardly becoming a hundredfold like you. As we become like you, you in us do the work. So I pray, Father. That you will maintain clearness of mind, right attitude, the right heart. You help us maintain a life of humility. And without you, we can do nothing. With you, we can do all things. But even with you, we must do it your way. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, just lift up both hands. Thank God for his word. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for truth. You said the truth will make us free. So I pray tonight as they inwardly agree with truth that truth will set them on a path that will bring destruction to that which hinders. That truth will navigate them on their path would keep them on the path and would help them overcome every obstacle. And that you would bring them, Lord, at the right place, at the right time, to the place of conquering and overcoming. Thank you, Father. Lord, we trust that truth will do that. Hallelujah, that it will continually work, unveiling, unfolding, showing, hallelujah, bringing revelation within to the unconscious and conscious mind. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, you will honor that in them, O great King. Hallelujah, praise God. If you believe with that, you agree with that, say amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We'll turn around and greet someone before you go.